Hi everyone and welcome to the Replenish Earth speaker series where we've a number of super interesting people um, exploring climate action in such innovative ways and today um, marks the second day of the London Climate Action Week which brings together um, a variety of national and international climate policy response prioritizing green recovery. We'll be exploring four very specific themes. The first is green, fair and resilient recovery. The second is a roadmap to COP26. The third is sustainable and net zero London. And the fourth is whole society climate mobilization. Join us as we explore how Today, the coffee trade can teach us about climate action. I'm your host, Tia Kansara, and today's speaker, John P. Kempf, um, is the founder of Jove Life, who helps to helps people to reduce plastic and pesticide use by providing them with an incredibly healthy, sustainable, organic, and freshly roasted premium coffee solution shipped um, mostly in the US. Um, but fully compostable packaging that positively impacts the environment through the planting of trees. Without further ado, welcome, John. Great to have you on the Replenish Earth Live. Thank you so much. This is going to be an awesome combo. I'm really excited. Yeah, totally. I'm um, I'm super interested in in exploring your story and how you got to the place that you are right now. And I know that what we went live with the coffee two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's kind of like incredibly fresh. And, you know, there's this, there's this relationship that we have with business. And I think for some time exploring capitalism and how so much of that industry of coffee trade and coffee futures and encouraging people to understand where the coffee industry can actually be, uh, you know, at the forefront of climate action. One would not maybe have put those two things together. So tell us, how did you, how did you come about, um, Jared of Life, and and also um, the the sort of the steps that you took to get here? We'd love to know. Yeah, absolutely. I love telling this story because I mean. I'm the kind of person that likes to clear the subtleties and go right to the depth of the issue and the root cause, if you will, functional medicine, but really within all beings on all layers. And GERF is like the reflective lesson of my entire life. I grew up, we nutrition was not a thing. Let's put it that way. Standard American diet all the way through. And I, you know, was athletic and, and played sports my whole life. Thank God I had some you know level of fitness because of that to kind of blunt the damage that i was doing nutritionally and uh then in college i started studying exercise science and nutrition and really started to realize like wow this is significant this is a big deal and it's kind of underplayed like we don't really talk about the significance of nutrition as much as we should especially in a college setting when you're going to school for that kind of thing and you're only getting you know one or two nutrition classes that are very basic so I started doing you know outside research and uh, that actually was when I decided personally I would you know take the call to action of the hero's journey I had a, mm -hmm. a very significant experience that prompted me to put on my big boy pants and grow up and uh, it was at the pivotal rock bottom of my life in all honesty I was you know I had um, failed out of college and I was just partying all the time. I didn't have a, a foundation at all. And I was really trying to kind of uh, numb myself out and avoid reality as much as I could. And then it was like the big wake up call of like, okay, you're, you know, there's nowhere else to go. You know, here was that opportunity. And I took it on myself as always being a leader in sports in whatever aspect of my life. I took that upon myself as a health and fitness professional to really walk the walk. That was when I really decided like, okay, I, I got the fitness thing down, strength and conditioning coach, but nutrition I'm missing, uh, mental health I'm missing, balance, harmony, you know, emotional well-being, being well, that was really something that was like at the root of it all. And uh, so I started my journey dedicating myself to just eating real food. I have this written down in a journal, May 6, 2013. Wow. I am now going to jerk just eat real food and, and that's where it started with just my eat real food yeah 
Yeah, Jerf, it's I heard it in 2013. And it was just perfect timing, of course, those things are. When I was ready, you know, it's always there, but then your eyes are open and you can see what was there all along. And Jerf, it just clicked. Like I knew that that was going to be the foundation of my nutrition principles, teaching people about, you know, the the nutrition aspect and well-being and health aspect, you know, along with the fitness. And that has really just catapulted my career to where I have transitioned more so from a personal trainer and strength and conditioning coach into a, a holistic health coach. And with incorporating uh, yoga, I began teaching yoga in 2013. And yoga and meditation are the staple for me. I mean, that's the foundation of practice that has allowed me to get to where I am ultimately within myself. But the Jerf journey is the encompassment of that yogic way of life, uh, traditional simple, in harmony with nature, you know, circle of life, Lion King stuff, you know, it's the basic, simple wisdom that we get caught up in this whole adulting and lose ourselves in that process. And coming back to the simplicity of nature, to me, if food is that gateway to nature and nature is the gateway to the divine and, you know, yourself, if you will. And so food is this pivotal bridge that we've really disconnected from as a modern species and it's you know the, the evolution of the brain from food and on and on you know discovery of fire and and being able to walk on two limbs to then hunt and all this stuff it's so cool it's like connected to who we are and now it's like through the drive door window and it's not even actually food we get sold food like products because they've got all the qualities of long shelf life cheap production all those aspects come into it and then we realize we're chasing a dollar sign the carrot on the stick but if we can just stop and say hey keto carnivore on and on tried them all worked with all the clients got them all it's just balance guys you know come back to jerf like you're eating vegan chips out of a plastic bag can we just start there and say hey that didn't grow out of the ground or <laughs> what's organic, you know? Oh my God, the number of times that people would come up to me and say, but it's vegan. Yeah, yeah. And that doesn't mean that it's healthy. And yeah. that doesn't mean that it doesn't have refined sugars. And it doesn't mean that, you know, it hasn't had a production process or a supply chain that is questionable. Or, or it doesn't have any fertilizers and chemicals in the actual agricultural process. So it's, it's a really interesting, um, almost like a, a full stop right like but but it's yeah that's that's what jerf to me represents is the materialized expression of an an increase in elevation and awareness when mm -hmm. people have the opportunity to look and like oh geez this mm -hmm. this is going to take 500 years to decompose <laughs> <laughs> i'm not going to be around for that and i'm just like choo, choo, choo. i mean guys i will <laughs> say it. i i'm all about authenticity and transparency I was the guy that was like the guy eco people make fun of and and don't like because I was really on that other side of just total unawareness and you know a, almost an abuse of you know really truly for all of us at some level it's an unconscious abuse of the abundance of resources that we have and we just again it's all about disconnection we're disconnected from our food and all those things so that jerf is kind of like you said, it's a hard stop where it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like we don't need to digress this anymore. You know, like kids don't know the names of fruits and vegetables. That's why I love what Vision Lakiani is doing of my valley, exposing these big industries like this. This was like really where it sparked it for me. I heard this presentation at a strength and conditioning conference by Peter Twist, Twist Strength and Conditioning. Shout out to you, Peter. He's an awesome guy. Beat stage four nas nasopharyngeal cancer. Absolute stud. And he just realized it was nutrition. Then he went down this rabbit hole and seeing companies partnering with the American Diabetes Association saying that it's kids safe and mom approved. And, and I mean that to me right there, like I, he was giving the speech and I started crying in the audience. And it's like a formal presentation with like coaches and therapists in the room, you know, in the chairs and the, you know, so it's like not that kind of setting. And I'm like, <laughs> you, you know, like, and so that's kind of, Growing up with that direct experience, bringing it all the way back to that of um, having family members that were obese, beyond obese, over 400 pounds, watching chronic disease and emotional 
unrest decomposed my entire family. And by witnessing that, it's made me who I am. I'm grateful for that. But it's instilled this passion in me, this compassion in me. Like, I really like the breaking down words. I think words are fascinating. Fascinating, excuse me. Um, compassion with passion. You know, it's expressing your authentic self to your fullest capacity. It's not necessarily mercy. You know, you know that that process is there as well. When you see and feel pain, you know, you create you know an emotional response to that. And I feel compelled because of that experience I had when I was young to go out and do that work because I know what that suffering is like. I've seen what it can do to people, and we can do something about that pretty easily. And Jerf is one of those just like little quick, like, whoa, whoa, like, why are we fighting over here in modern first world society about these things when it's like, we know who the culprits are. We know, everybody knows, guys, come on, cultural conditioning, psychology 101, it's a real thing. So it's now been, the ball's been passed to us as representatives of society and as the earth collectively, like, hey, we vote with our dollar, with our attention, and, and with our time, with our focus. All is mind. So all we have to do is just stop feeding that wolf and shift our attention. And that's ultimately the whole idea with functional medicine as well. Like if you get hit by a bus, go to the hospital. Acute medicine is great. It's going to take care of you. They set bones. You know, surgery is an incredibly modern and awesome technology. There's so many things that are beneficial about that. But we're not talking about acute disease. We're talking about chronic disease. And the, it's not about tearing down the old system, just build a new one right next to it. It's the same thing with this. Like if, if we as small business owners can get the community on our side to shift their attention over to a more conscious way of life, as that awareness collectively continues to increase, regardless, you know, if we want it to or not, then that expression in our material world via jerf life, via plastic over here and we start to, oh, you know, like I just had a conversation with a guy the other day and he's like, I got to thinking one day randomly about how coffee and he just like, you know, and it's probably, there's probably a lot to this, you know, and he just had gotten to that level of awareness where in his physical reality, he realized that there may be something that he could do to live in harmony, create, you know, whatever, create something better than what he had in that moment and so this is just that like little sliver like doesn't have to be anything fancy coffee is the second largest traded commodity in the world if we start there and just say okay how many plastic bags can we avoid if we just shift to a compostable coffee source i love my coffee guys you know i've got my mug right here too. drink coffee plant trees and so it's not going away modern consumerism isn't going away let's just build a better model right next to the current one that we can slowly start to shift over to as that awareness rises. One of the things that was coming up whilst you were talking is the um, the Netflix uh, documentary, The Game Changers. Um, really fascinating exploration of health and preventative health. And it, I've been very fortunate that in my family growing up, there were there were so many solutions. There were so many ways that you could preventatively manage your health and because I was exposed to that from a really young age um you know the moment that we you know anybody felt a little bit sniffly or ill or uncomfortable about something in their body there would be some adaptogen um perhaps there would be like a ginger tea that my mum would make or you know there was um, a very specific um you know spice or something that would be included in our food so having that understanding and having the knowledge of local foods uh, can be really helpful in understanding what your body needs for the climate that you're living in. So the Japanese have a tradition that if you eat all the food from within something close to 12 or something miles of where you're living, then the climate that you're in will match the food that you need to meet the body needs um, of you living in that climate. What happens is we tend to not have that continuation of connectivity the, to the locale, and in you know as a result of that, we sort of miss out on the opportunity of living local and healthy, but from the local sort of supply chain. Um, 
What what are your thoughts on that? I mean, firstly, on Game Changers, because that was such a big documentary and it was a great learning um, with Arnold Schwarzenegger, I think it was, talking about how, you know, he has transformed his um, his diet and that there is, you know, somewhat a fallacy of vegan food not being proteinous for us. Yeah, so being a strength and conditioning coach and an exercise physiologist, this is a subject that I'm 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 such a nerd about. I really really love it. And again, it's a really big reason why I am a proponent of the Jerf diet because there are so many factors to play in bioindividuality, right? There's 40 variables to account for for each individual human based at where they are in their space time <laughs> continuum to where today it might be okay for you tomorrow not. And the, mm -hmm. I, I love research. I'm a super nerd. So things like, for example, studies with someone with multiple personality disorder, they are allergic to oranges in one personality or citrus, if you will, and not in the other. And then they hook them up and find out that that instantaneously, sh that instantaneous shift in personality, actually immediately changed biochemical uh, reactions with the enzymes being produced. And so when the allergic person shifted over psychologically, then physiologically there was a response in the body that was yay or nay. And then they switched personality again and, and back to, you know, not being allergic to it in moments time. So that I think is just a really humbling, uh, conclusion research study experiment to show it'd be pretty ignorant for us to say we know how it works and this is the way and we'll never evolve beyond this level of thinking and understand it at a more complex level and i think that's something just with the ego the whole idea is like i figured it out and that makes me important so that way i can get acknowledged and recognized by my peers and then i'll ultimately feel loved at the end of the day and accepted and so there's so much charge that goes behind scientific fact and information in regard specifically to that movie even where we have to start to ask questions about agenda, propaganda, money, where's the money coming from and where's it going surrounding that film. And I'm all about increasing awareness. And I think what we need to do is not necessarily highlight the one way or poke sticks at the right or the left or vegan or carnivore. And it's more so say, like I was saying, let's go back to jerf. Let's take all the vegans and all the carnivores and put them in the same room and just get them to shake hands and say, Hey, at least we're eating real food. You know, like let's start there because there's so many other individualities from there. And I think that there are certain people that will do better on a vegan diet and some people that won't. And again, there's a lot of factors there and it's something I'm really deeply passionate about. And so there's so much complexity to that conversation that's totally not relevant to this conversation per se. I, saying, Other... I, think, I think what was really intriguing for me was that, you know, less about whether it's important to be a vegan or not. It's um, It was the understanding of, you know, how far can you take how good food is for you? So if we're talking about, um, you know, just eat real food. Well, what is real food? Mm -hmm. Some people might say real food is going to get fast food. Um, some people may say that real food is, um, you know, the, the the food that they get at the supermarket, the Marks and Spencer's, Waitrose, Sainsbury's. I remember diving in, um, I think it was in Egypt last year at the in the Red Sea and we were swimming with dugongs. And I remember the the, the guy who buddied up with me was supplying the same grapes to a supermarket in the UK called Aldi, as well as Waitrose with just different packaging, but the source was exactly the same. The price of obviously was not. So I think what's re really, you know, the, the question at heart is less about what's right and wrong in terms of whether to or not to eat meat, um, but actually what does real food actually constitute? What, what does it mean? Um, you know, I'm happy to share my opinions there, but I thought I'd, you know, get get your get your ideas on what does it mean to eat real food? Because that's what people think that they're doing anyway. Yeah, and I, I, that's why I think there's a lot of merit to that movie in the sense that they're raising awareness about the, the big meat industry 
versus holistic agricultural practices, if you will, you know, which, and that I think deserves absolute merit because, you know, we're going back to the circle of life conversation then of, you know, I, it's what they're doing in biggest industry in every field is heinous. We know it, you know, like the, um, CAFO, uh, the, the large industrial animal feedlot operations, uh, those are, it's, it's sad. It really is. It's not, it's not at all something that is, you know, that someone would be like, that's totally normal, like a farm, you know, it's not, it's not anything like that anymore. That even in my opinion, I mean, that's not necessarily real food. If, if it's taken out of its natural cycle of life. And I love the example for humans, you know, it's a, it's bear with me a little barbaric, but if you were to walk into a mall or something and you were going to pick which human you'd want to eat for the healthiest you know, one on the menu, you know, would you pick the person that's lean and muscular and looks like they got good skin? Or would you pick the person that's like really obese and you know, you are what you eat in that sense. So if you see the cow or the chicken or or the plant, you know, it's no different. If you, if the plant is does not have a robust immune system, then it's compromised as well. If it's not getting the nutrients from the soil that it needs to, you know, grow at its optimal level, then or if it's getting treated after it's farmed, when it's put on the shelves in the grocery store, every layer we're taking it away from its natural state the Tao, uh, you know, the natural cycle, the circle of life. And I think that's, you know, ultimately the message I want to express with Jerf is to show people like, hey, it's not, it's not, you know, what does real food look like? You know, I like that idea of that conversation of just rewind 200 years and go ask your great, great grandparents for some organic carrots. And they'd be like, what's organic, you know? Uh, that to me is um, like Michael Pollan has a really good line. He's a great um, inspiration for me in the, in the nutrition industry. And he says, if it grows, uh, from a plant, eat it. If it grows in a plant, don't eat it. And just, you know, made by nature, made by man. I think that's really the big distinguishing factor to start with, with Jerf. Just to challenge you a bit there, of course, there is the, you know, the position that many in the industry, the agricultural industry will take. That is that we've got a lot of people to feed. So that's a job. Oh, we can, oh you know, in a lot of people to feed. Um, we can't feed them unless if we're producing the amounts that we are. In terms of the meat specifically. No, just anything, right? Like, and you know, oh. taking taking the perspective that we are, you know, food grows. I mean, we've learned to till the earth. We've learned to plow the earth, and the moments that that we've learned to do that, we've you know, taken apart the mycelial networks, the way that they actually work, the mycology of it has already been destroyed in so many areas around the world. And if we were in place of that to really learn how to work with the land instead of against it, then perhaps what we as humans have done is learn how to cultivate and harvest. You know, I wonder who it was that learned that, you know, this is the seasonal cycle of, uh, you know, a, a grain of wheat for example, to take that and to grow that. And I remember in one of these beautiful locations, I took my mum there for her 50th, uh, Lothal. It's um, a site in Gujarat in India, which is something close to 4,000 years old. And I remember sitting there and it, it used to be a dock and there was a grain storage next to the dock because they used to transport them. And they had these places where they would bake um, using the wheat and the wheat themselves, they sort of planted it and they knew what these cycles were thousands of years before then too. So it's curious that something that we've learned to automate in a, a plant in um, some level of hybrid solution is our justification for doing that. Yet, you know, we have been learning and, and we've known about this for a while. So what is it specifically about the plant that makes it wrong? Is it the process? Is it the um, the pre and the post part of it? You know, is it the entire system that it's that it's a uh, you know um, one step off? Yeah, and that's that's so great too because uh, you know it's really a call 
uh, of responsibility I see for all of us to find that better solution. Because ultimately, all of those steps in the process are going to continue to evolve and get refined and like the brain surgery back in the 1700s. Great idea, not quite there yet, you know? And a lot of advances along the way in, in a lot of those technological areas, you know, with everything. So I think we'll just continue. Really, the conversation is an important part. And then something that I know you and I talked about that you're passionate about, too, is living it, you know, individually as the consumer. Like we we can have the interviews and run the businesses and all that. But, you know, if you catch me on a Tuesday afternoon down on Main Street, am I am I practicing what I preach there? You know, like you're, you always know, you know, there's, you're the one that's always watching, you know, your heart knows. It's like uh, this, this one guy, motivational speech, Greg Plitt, RIP. Great. He's, he just had something that stuck with me in a speech I heard. And he, he's like, if that receipt falls out of your pocket on the sidewalk, do you stop and turn around and go pick it up? If you're cleaning your car and you miss a spot, you put everything away and then you notice it. Do you just let it go or do you get everything back out and do you finish the job? Do you do it right? And I think that's just a level of responsibility for each of us, which is why, you know, Drift Life came to be outside of my coaching business, because that's really what I encompass through um, my leadership coaching. My health coaching is, you know, live it, embody it. The teachings are within us. They're in our DNA. The information is there. The solutions are there to all the questions that we have right now within us and we just have to you know turn the key you know turn the tumbles of the key to open that door whatever that is that perspective that idea that comes forth conversation and uh so it's just you know each of us i think you know looking at that a little bit closer for ourselves of like where can we contribute in that process how can we make that better and keep having those conversations because this is still pretty new for a lot of people you know like i've only been living sustainably in in truth for less than a decade and I've been alive for three decades. So 20 years, I was totally not paying attention to any of that, not caring at all. And I'm, you know, I absolutely can see and and have compassion for those people that aren't there yet. And I think a lot of people, they start to get that kind of a spiritual authority kind of complex where holier than thou because I recycle or or whatever that is that you know, I think just leading by example and not having to necessarily use our words, but use our actions for people. But John, to... what do you think is like the, the the place of compassion here? Because, of course, for some of us, we've been picking up rubbish as part of our detention since we were kids. Or mm -hmm. for some of us, my, uh, you know, our moms have been recycling every single item in the house because that's what they do in, in certain parts of India. Or, you know, from a young age, we've been watching the Savannah on TV and David Attenborough documentaries because that's what yeah. dad used to watch, right? And dad's yeah. got control over the remote. Um, so for, for some of us, that has been our, you know, almost like the seeding through which we've been behaving. And... When you talk about the actual DNA, that it's in the DNA, what do you mean by that specifically? Um, I think I've got a, a general idea, but I'd love to know from your perspective, perhaps through the science or through the research that you've done or the practices that you've got with the actual coaching of Jeff Life, where do you see that people are actually accessing that? What, what do you mean by it? Yeah, I think, um, you know, that's a... a awesome large question looking at the the scope of um time and space and consciousness and that's um, more the realm that i'm interested in and uh looking at uh some research uh that i found from billy carson uh he speaks about how they actually there's research now where they put onto a piece of dna a certain amount of information like a hard drive like a, or a thumb drive if you will they in they had like a pdf or something like that and they copied it x million times and loaded it into a piece of dna and then actually downloaded it from the dna back onto like their server or whatever so it was proving that dna itself is like a thumb drive or a hard drive a, a memory storage device Interesting. And the amount of storage capacity that they estimated that it had through their calculations was like really, really crazily coincidental to 
the like amount of time since the Big Bang to now, uh, kind of reinforcing a lot of the ideas of quantum physics and entanglement where everything is connected to uh, the same origin, that same Big Bang point, the center. And that's what I see as um, kind of the access point for us with these esoteric teachings is accessing the memory or accessing what I like to call the term that I use within my coaching is body wisdom. And we, you know, which, which you could bring out as intuition, but what is intuition? Is it actually a database of information that we can access at some degree and we just don't know how that works and you know you know there's some of those questions there where it's hard to postulate in theory but then we see through the thousands and thousands of years all these subtle signs and uh texts you know like we started putting stuff down on the wall and turning it into art and turning it into story and turning it into books and then that has passed on through time, but a lot of these principles of, you know, you could say the the hermetic principles or, you know, some of the um, correlations that you'll see in all the spiritual texts throughout the world, they talk about some of these similar things and how to access potentially this body wisdom, this center point, whatever it may be. And you'll see a lot of them are very similar using different words. It's just a different culture with a different language was explained the same process or likely very similar in just a little bit different way. And then they took that and evolved that. If we look at Taoist yoga and then we look at Qigong and we look at, you know, some of those other energetic practices like Ulu out here in Hawaii, they're all the same exact thing. It's taking energy from the spine, the cerebrospinal fluid and moving it up from the sacrum to the crown. And then we see, you know, the, the throne of God, and these pictures, these paintings, Michelangelo's hand reaching out and God, quote unquote, is sitting on a throne and it's the image of the brain and it's the pineal gland where he's sitting, which is this access point, the rainbow bridge. Again, so many names between different cultures, but the point of it all is there's you know many paths to the same forest, but the forest exists and it's only something that you can experience directly. And when you do, that changes your perspective on everything, especially how you live your life in harmony with your environment and those within it. I think one one of the 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 words that you um, that you called out, which was really fascinating for me, is intuition. Uh, for me, intuition is inner tuition. It's that which connects us to ourselves. And it's interesting that you've related that sort of intuition with the DNA and how we've emerged as beings holding the memory stick of life. And, you know, in, in every single one of us is the ability to understand where we've come from, our genome. Like I get all sorts of interesting reports that are sent to me through 23andMe. Oh, you are now a connection of dun, 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 dun. Um, Or, you know, this is the genome that the father's line sort of like follows and this is how old it is. And it is actually really fascinating when you start to explore, you know, the the entire you know, relationship that we have with humanity through our DNA. I mean, this is this is current science. I'm not talking about this will be forever the way that we see something. I think through science and through knowledge and through acknowledgement, we realize that the atom is not the smallest particle, you know, that, that something goes beyond quantum and something goes beyond the universe into the multiverse. So we're never really there. We're always holding a piece of knowledge or a piece of science or understanding as a as a current dream time now situation from you know the um the words of the uh beautiful indigenous tribes aboriginals in um in australia and i feel that you know this somehow ley lines and beautiful um walks that communities can make through these grid type structures which is something that we call the indra's net this kind of like ultimate connectivity between matter and energy is is um a source of a lot of inspiration for me when it comes to the inner tuition. I think in terms of the DNA, I think what for me was um, a turning point is in recognizing that my body knows what it's doing. And when it comes to the wisdom, my body knows what it's doing without my acknowledgement of what it's doing. I can't stop my heart from beating. I might be able to slow it down by sort of like managing my breath, but I can't stop my heart beating. 
Um, perhaps an advanced yogi can do that. Um, I've never been able to achieve something like that. But I'm curious, you know, when we associate our bodies as non-nature, right, for for much of the, I think the wording and consumerism that has been taught to us has been, we are not nature, nature is separate from us. And so this is almost um, a recognition of the the human, human, human um, energy that sort of runs our body, right? Like if I, one may call it consciousness, I think there's a lot of, um, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, different views on what consciousness actually is, but we are, forever within this fear of the planet and where you know the the um we're indigenous to it this is this is the land through which we've you know that we were born through the elements of of you know what created us so it's really interesting about uh the connection through humanity through us and what we are doing on the planet today with all the histories and the myths and the stories that we come with yeah and i that to me is the the most fascinating aspect because i'm a pattern recognition kind of person and i'm i'm a i'm a big picture kind of person i like to really look at the the larger picture and i came from a background of skepticism mind oriented living and you know physical material focused and i still really appreciate that because I can engage in the world in a way where I can conduct business and, you know, not be too far out there, hippie woo woo, but being able to spend enough time and have the intention towards cultivating some higher aspect of awareness or beingness that I may not be able to explain, but I can feel it, that direct experience. I love the quote, I believe it's Carl Jung. He says, intellectualism is often a common cover up for the fear of direct experience. And I think that's so powerful because that intuition, like you said, is to me, it's a knowing, it's truth. And you know truth, when you hear truth, you know truth, it's like a tuning fork, it resonates within you and your being. And um, that's interesting because it's relevant to the conversation, but something that um, I'm really big on and I actually host retreats out here on Maui for is fasting and meditation. I believe fasting is an incredible tool to help you tune into that body wisdom by kind of removing that external white noise of all the stuff all the time. And uh, Vipassana is another uh, kind of method of that as well, where you're just, um, and this is the term I use in my fasting and meditation retreats, Svadhyaya really just turning the eyeballs from outside and looking within and self-care, you know, doing the due diligence and paying the respects to the physical body as a vessel that we have, knowing that there's something else there. Might not be able to explain it, but it's guiding us, you know, all the time. It's just on us to listen to it. And oftentimes we just boop, 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 boop. I, I believe it was Jesus said that the longest road a man will take is from his mind to his heart. And I think that has been a very strong experience for me of not trying to hammer a square peg into a round hole, trusting the, the divinity and, and perfection of nature. And I think Jerf again is that great bridge to help people reconnect. And it's a slight, just that little realization because it worked for me. Food, you know, even though I didn't realize the energetic spiritual connection to food in my own journey, at that point, but it was that starting point and it turned my health around physically, which allowed me to see more mentally clearly. And then once I had more mental clarity, I started to tune into that voice, that inner voice, that intuition that then I could use as a little bit more of a, a compass on my path. And you know, Jerf, it really was the start of that for me. I think that, um, you know, food has such a big part to play in the way that we are composed. like you know, where all of these beautiful elements and at the same time, what we put into our bodies shifts the composition and the chemistry inside our bodies, right? That in itself is so beautiful. I remember uh, a very uh, beautiful book that was written, I uh, can't think of it right now, but it was it was almost like um, the um, a letter of love that a tomato is, 
seeing the stars at night and having the sun in the during the day and the number of times that it is um that letter of you know the the seasons the days the everything to get to the point that you would then consume that um, or put it into your mouth and eat the tomato so it's it's a it's this incredible connection with nature that we have and i think um the first time i came across the the um the malpractice through desperation of distribution of food across lands where we have this you know opportunity to really understand where food is coming from and going um Khalid al Shamsi whilst I was doing my PhD in in Abu Dhabi uh one of his friends said have you ever come across uh, uh an organic farm and I said what in the desert like wait what um he said yes it's the first uh organically certified farm in Abu Dhabi I said well that's insane I've never heard of such a thing and how do you grow things and what do you grow and of course you know unbeknownst to me there was an incredible farm and I remember a friend a friend of mine Richard who was doing the um pearl rating system building um assessments with me you know I said well Richard do you want to come with me and he said yeah let's go let's go and find out what this organically certified food is um because it was quite rare for for us to have experienced that in Abu Dhabi and we're talking 2010 ish and the farm had been going since 2007 so we arrived at this farm in the middle of nowhere and i think i ran around and just cried because till that point i had never eaten food that tasted that good and um Khalid was in um a 4x4 sort of like taking us around in his um in his vehicle identifying different practices in the actual organic farm that were really quite endearing like um no pesticides so what then would you use in place of that um you know all all different kinds of measures that are really fascinating to me now which we can use and there are solutions for but we just don't ever learn about and i remember he picked up a cucumber and gave it to me and said mm, you want me to eat the cucumber like that I was like yeah so i tried it and i was like wow this is actually quite good and then picked up a uh, a mulberry from one of the trees and handed that to me and firstly i don't think i'd ever eaten a mulberry before then um i knew what they were just you know it's just obviously not in my climate zone so then i picked up a mulberry and i was like wow this is this is really good and i remember picking up um uh, a corn and he said try this and i up until that point only ever had you know corn that was cooked so taking raw corn and and taking a big bite of it was kind of a rare so you know rare experience for me and i just remember looking at richard who was in the back of the car with me and thinking what's in this food what's in this food and maybe it was at that point that i was like what's in the other food mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. this is good stuff and this is organically certified and this is you know ichea certified later on we had a journey to uh Tuscany where I met one of my dearest friends Francesco at Poggio Fuoco Farm which is all about the practices of um Ichea's organic certification um mm. but it just you know it it awoken it, it awoken a sense of taste in me that I had never had before I never knew that it was even possible my sister's laughing in the chat it I didn't know it was possible to even have this this um the the taste of food that was raw but tasted better than food that was cooked and you know my sister is a great chef um she makes the best indian food in the world but um aside from that i think it's you know it's it's really um i think it's really an opportunity to recognize what what does food mean to us what does the system that surrounds food um in the growing of food in the production of food in the transport of food um in the policy of food and the opportunities and the business models of food coffee being one as you said uh one of the largest commodities that we trade um it is it's becoming this sort of i remember coffee futures for starbucks something that they had purchased for many years so that they can ensure that coffee production uh was safe you know even during hiccups like the economic downturn mm-hmm. so yeah i mean there is i think a lot to learn from this relationship that we have with taste and food and you know when we talk about real food this is what it reminds me of that real food is this connection that we have with the body's composition and the relationship that we have with what we need you know just because you have porridge every single day in the morning doesn't mean that your body needs necessarily porridge every single day um we have a, an incredible fast on the um 
two particular days where the um, the moon's position and the so, sort of like a solar Jyotish Shastra type thing called Ekadashi, uh, for which there is um, a recommended fast for that day. And the reason for it is that that is the day. I mean, the, the moon has huge impacts on water. It has a huge impact on the way that uh, women's cycles uh, run throughout the month to um, the connections with the ocean. And so you can only imagine that the moon's uh, relationship with the actual body also has significance. So during Ekadashi, um, you know, there's a, a huge recommendation that people give the digestive system a rest. And so there are, as you said, like whether it's Taoism or yogic practice, there are, you know, so many different practices around the world that educate us about, you know, what our bodies feel and, and what we can do to even shift the composition of that body, you know, that very much like we can change the environment that we're in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, this is really coming up strongly. I just want to mention, P.S., that new moon last night. Let's go. But I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> the uh, make your intentions. <laughs> oh, yeah. And me and my partner, she's a farmer. And so we have our own garden out back. And I don't know much about farming or gardening. And so she ah. it's been beautiful for me because I'm helping train her and teach her about movement and the body. And she's helping me learn about nature and plants and gardening. And so it's a beautiful dynamic. And we did a bunch of vision mapping yesterday and laid everything out. And it was awesome. But uh, I just had something that really I wanted to mention from one of my greatest teachers, Ramana Maharshi. Mm -hmm. He really emphasized the fact that you're already there. You know, we're already there. That body wisdom, that intuition, you know, that guiding knowledge that's there. We are it already. You know, you don't need to go out to attain happiness, you know, because that comes from that perspective that you're not already there, that you're separate from nature itself. And I will just absolutely attest, it's it's so true. A lot of the, the spiritual sages will tell you, go out into nature and just be quiet and listen. And in your your whole life will change, your whole being, your vibration, your expression, everything will change just by going out and connecting to nature and seeing, you know, by by being more aware and conscious of plants, it's made me more aware and conscious of animals and other beings because you can see an intelligent design. Like I'm watching these weeds grow right next to this other plant and not surface until they're ready to flower so they can spread their seeds. Cause otherwise you'd pick them. And that's intelligence. Like it blows my mind how intelligent plants are, but they're incredible chemists because they're not mobile. So to like all that, and it just like all the connections, the little dots. And it's just like, I mean, you, you brought me to tears a little bit just a moment ago talking about food because it's that connection it's in everything. And nature is just like such a healing tool for that. And Jerf Life is kind of my like public kumbaya, like, hey, everybody, <laughs> like, we're all, we're good. We're, you know, like the Buddha said, you don't get angry, you become anger, you embody that vibration. And so yourselves being these beautiful, perfect beings of knowledge already, they are just going to respond to what you're telling them to do, essentially. So I really like that idea of like just slowing down, you know, things detaching from the modern day rat race and jerf fasting, jerfing, going and hug a tree, you know, those things that just slow down and come back to like, oh, okay, yeah, you know, we're already good here, right here, just slowly building that through whatever practice calls to you, you know, it doesn't have to be yoga. It could just be going for a walk out in nature every day. You know, it's going to look different for everybody. Funny because yog is is connection, right? <laughs> to to be in connection with the with is the question mark with whom or what or you know inner tuition for me or intuition is the turning in of the senses. It's the inward, you know, the the perspective of the inward nature uh, rather than the outward nature, both of which exist. That's the anomaly of the indoors and the outdoors. We we sort of like when we turn our senses in, when we turn our sight in, our you know all of our sensations that are happening inside our body from the, the pulse that we can feel of, of, you know, our heart rate going around our body to really connect with that cycle and the movements and the sensations and the sparkles and the, the jiggling and the whatever else wants to occur. 
but knowing that it's there and often we're not in connection with our body so much so I remember many of my coaches would say yeah from that point down like what's going on like intellectual arrogance over here like when do you connect with your body and when are you in touch with the the parts of your body that are trying to tell you something and many of my coaches through the work of the saboteurs will sort of like connect different parts of the body in terms of emotional digestion right like how do you digest your emotions when you're feeling something and we've all been through this throughout the entirety of this uh, pandemic and in exploring where is the heaviness and the pain and the sorrow and the sadness the guilt the shame the letting go of people you know people have died in um in the pandemic we've experienced loss we've experienced mourning um you know we're saying goodbye to a previous identity as a whole of the community as a nation um the whole of the uk is in lockdown at the moment so it's it's like you know we're 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 saying goodbye and in this transition is the opportunity to to open up to what could be um uh, something quite refreshing but our senses have been turned inwards right we're in our homes we're in hibernation we're turning into winter soon and that sort of like you know the the sort of the the moment that the caterpillar closes its eyes for the last time and mm-hmm. opens its eyes as as the first time where that transition between the caterpillar and the butterfly works both from the imaginal cells of holding both forms that's exactly where we are right that moment where you know we close our eyes to one and we open our eyes to another but it's a case of opening your eyes before you that da- before you do that you still need to close your eyes mm-hmm. in order for you to connect with the imaginal cells within to let go to surrender to that death you know and i mean okay. sata lama you know birth life death rebirth every day every moment all the time in in different layers and different aspects for each of us individually but that's been the calling for sure and you know my perspective too is those who are in tuned with that body wisdom there's been a call for more yin more nourishing more you know like you said awareness like hold that darkness you know like that's us the darkness is just as beautiful and that's the catalyst that we can use in this metamorphic transition to actually say hey no free will says i can choose and i choose a better way i choose this way i think in terms of choices of course we have you know i remember and i think it was my tedx san francisco i talked about how you are the ultimate you know empowered self to decide how you want your choice of use of money or the use of consumerism or use of products so your relationship with yourself or your relationship with others you are the ultimate power but if i tell you over and over again that you are a slave and you believe it you are a slave there is no way that i can get that out of your head till the moment that you stand up and you say i am not a slave to i am i am not in serve you know in service to x thinking you cannot bring in y thinking it's just it's like that has taken over the entirety of your cymatics and what i mean by cymatics go and check it out it's the work of uh emoto it's the work of all of those musicians who understand vibration and sound it's a scientific process of putting very specific sound next to matter and seeing how the vibrational frequency can shift form it's where matter becomes and i think sound has a huge impact in the way that matter is created and i feel that that relationship is really an exploration of form how do we create and how does that creation become something really quite special um i know that you know i think during this transition we've really been um sitting in the dark and i want to really pull that out a bit sitting in the dark not just being we can't see something we have no idea what's happening next we don't know what's coming around the corner mm-hmm. you know um forecasting what's happening in the economy or forecasting what's happening in the you know in the um the FTSE 500 or the forecasting what's happening in our lives is it's almost impossible so how do we how do we sit in the uncertain how do we receive the the messages 
in that uncertain zone. Like it should just be called uncertainty, right? 100% of it. And to be able to claim that uncertainty as your own by letting go of the certain conditions that we've created, right? Like love, conditioned love, if then statements with the world, with the planet, with ourselves, with others. It's as if that's kind of like shifting. And all of a sudden it's, we you can't have conditions with something you don't know what the conditions are for. So what does it mean to have that unconditional love where there are no if then statements? Yeah. So I went a bit <laughs> this this is the stuff that people are like, gosh, can more people talk about this, please? I really would like some clarity. You know? And <laughs> it's, it goes back to that direct experience, but that's that's it, you know. It always goes back to a perspective of energy because energy exists beyond matter, before matter, if you will. And so it's always going to come back to that core principle somewhere. And this is my, my coaching business is called Henosis. This is a perfect example. 2017, sitting in meditation, Henosis. I'm like, what? Google it. Henosis is the ancient Greek word for mystic union, interconnectedness, the primordial oneness in all things. It's the Greek word for yoga or for the Tao or source. It's all the same thing. And I just had these strong compilations to do this, put forth this divine work of um, bringing people back to that oneness, you know, and you have to die. You know, I love the quote that I, I what is it? I do not fear death, nor, or um, I do not desire death, nor do I cling to life. It's in the Tao, they would call it Wu Wei or non-responsiveness. You, you, you don't, react you respond and that your ability to respond from your center becomes that guiding force as the 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 one source point the one creator of your own individual life and that's you know when we start to get into the all the all of the homies are talking about the same thing and how you get there is up to you that's going to be your own individual direct experience but once you're there all you want to do with every fiber of your being is get as many people as you can there too. Wow, I didn't know this feeling was even possible. I wonder if I can share this with others. I would that's the only thing I would ever want is for someone to experience oneness with themselves. And if we do that, if that's the center driving intention, if that's the focus point, and all of that information is already in our DNA. All the lessons are already there. If we can just let go from what it looks like from the mind's, the mind's eye and the expectations and the conditions that we set and just trust and have faith. And that to me is courage. Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is the intention to stand up and face the fear anyway, even though it's you're, you're still going to be afraid, but you choose free will choice to do it anyway. And that just has to come through a process of direct experience that builds this quality of faith, this trust that I am the creator of my reality. And what I say goes and what you said, something that's very powerful in my teaching and I agree with completely is the power of word vibration. In the beginning, there was the word and the word was God and God created through the word. I am the story that I believe that I tell to the world, whatever that may be, and it will reflect in your material world on those thoughts, feelings, values, and beliefs. Your personality creates that personal reality, as Joe Dispenza would say. So if we can just get people to step back and, you know, start to connect to that and like, oh, that breadcrumb, breadcrumb of inspiration, as Abraham Hicks would say, that little like, oh, synchronicity of like, oh, that, mm, there was something there. And like, You'll feel the inspired action. You'll feel your soul leap a little. It's a really easy practice. I really like the open palm uh, where if something feels good, if it doesn't feel good, there's going to be a retraction and an expansion and opening or a retraction. And if you don't feel it, sit with it for a while and, and, you know, try to silence it. But that's a pretty easy way to just start of like what feels right. Am I going down that path where I'm discovering myself, my purpose, all those life questions start to come up. But as long as we can give people that that light, that guiding hope that, hey, you can do this too. Like I, I was I was the spitting example. Like people, my friends, the reason people follow me and believe me in my story is because they know that I 
I made it. If I can make it, anybody can make it. And it's just a matter of belief and faith and failing. The more. About the body, right? Like the body knows and the body keeps the score. What's that? Who's that author of the book? I mean, it's it's one of those your body always remembers. And I remember this incredible, like there's so many of these stories. One of the things that came to mind was how your body always knows and holds that information and teaches you what the body actually knows and tells you, yet you don't hear, right? Because yeah. the senses, the ears are not working on the inside. If they were, then you'd hear what was going on. And so there is this connection between that which we've been living and, and that which we can invite in, right? Into the space and into, and create that space for it. Now is the, now is a great time to, um, to find your inner truth, whatever that truth is. I and mean, everyone's got that lived experience. Your experience is yours. Your experience is, you know, the, the, um, the subjective reality that you have lived. To say that everybody has the same reality is, is like some scientific, uh, you know, uh, mess. I mean, it's not true. We don't have the same reality. We've lived different realities of the same source potentially the same ingredients, but we are never going to make the same cake twice. You know that I know that, but yet we believe it. I think this is where it comes back to, you know, the ultimate truth in life is death. It's the yeah. end, right? It's knowing that this is going to end, this too shall end. And yet end is, um, you know, not as often seen as the labor of love. Like life is not seen as the labor of love to death. And I feel that whether you believe in God or you don't believe in God, whether you believe in the divine, you don't believe in the divine, whether you feel that you're guided or that you know that you're not. It's that, you know, loving yourself and loving those around you is in itself the most difficult task of recognizing that which inside you has not been filled, right? When you look at something and, the, and I, for example, an archetype comes up talking about women who run with the wolves, an archetype sort of appears and you're like, wow, that personality, pff, can't stand it. And that personality is almost as if it is, like you were talking about multiple personalities. I think we all have multiple personalities and those personalities appear in these archetypes when we start to behave in very different ways. When, for example, a profile over here is like this, but a profile over there might be slightly different. So that in itself is a contradiction of the self where one represents and expresses something very particular in these archetypes are the sort of the immature and the mature, right? The ego that the matures into that archetype and that which doesn't. So there are moments where we meet people that actually almost are the mirror and it's very difficult to see that we may or may not have actually matured within that archetype of ourselves and in, into one of the personalities that we hold. Um, so it is, it's really quite fascinating. And gosh, um, we can totally... Um, we can totally go on about this topic because it's one of my favorites. But it does come back to uh, food and it does come back to what we're eating and it comes back to our composition and it comes back to what and how we're mindful and creating the reality that we want to be able to live consciously because we've decided that that's what we're going to do. It's nobody else's decision but your own. And reclaiming that decision for yourself is, um, I think, the message of this talk. That's living. You know, it's something actually... I just had a little download in the shower. It's oftentimes I get great insights and it was in preparation for this talk and it, I don't know why, but it just came to me and it's interesting that you brought that up because everybody dies, but not everybody lives. And what you said right there is that claiming of ownership. That is the moment, that is the rebirth, if you will, you know, born again is like, now it's game time. Now it's real. Like you don't, you have that level of awareness. Now, once you put the glasses on, you can't take them off. Once you know, you can't unknow. And you get to that point within yourself where that's the whole game, you know, and some would say at a different perspective, the contrast is a necessary catalyst to allow you to come to that realization. Sure was for me. <laughs> I let it ride as long as I could until the knocking on the door was so loud. It was kicking the door down. It was, you know, and, and, yeah, yeah, like, okay, okay. I surrender. And that was the start for me. And I think that for everybody is you have to die before you can live with that understanding that no matter what you do as long as you're doing it from a place of sincerity you you cannot go wrong you cannot fail, sort fail. Of, me of this beautiful quote by mark twain you know the two most important 
you know, days of your life or the reasons for living, the first, um, you know, the first imp important day is the day that you're born and the second is the, is the day that you realize why. And I feel that, you know, many of us have been living a routine. We've been living the rat race. We've been living a very particular season without realizing. And this moment of, you know, the, the inner work is, is where we're emerging as, as uh, people who want to explore why we're doing the things that we are. To understand perhaps if we want to change our minds we can um i realize we've gone over time sorry audience we got a bit excited um but i i hope you really enjoyed it please leave your comments and your questions in the chat it's going to be um you know really really uh, an opportunity to to explore what this sort of inner journey is please get in contact with john um i've got some of the um you know, ways of, of contacting him directly. Um, I just wanted to, to share um, a little note from Anna, who's always been um, a big supporter of Replenish Earth. And um, she says, the spirit fire that burns all that is not required. So the spirit is fully present. It is the down cord of the universe with a sacred pulse of earth pulsing through us without interference. And I think that connection when we when we talk about grounding and rooting and sitting and sacrum to cranium, like, you know, those sort of like the entire sort of map of the tree, right, is ultimately the connection that we have with with ourselves, with the planet and the, you know, beautiful, you know, connection point of the tree into the ground and the way that it sort of cords into the ground is ultimately, you know, we we kind of see ourselves as as this superior entity and superior being, but ultimately we are that which you know is is also manifest is manifested through us, right? Connected with us, and you know I think that comes back to the yoga, and it, it comes back to all of these beautiful intelligences around the world with you know so much more than we can even put into words. So John, yeah. Yeah, thank, you. My... thank you so much for your time and thank you so much for your thoughts and thank you so much for yeah, the, the coffee company that for me represents this move and shift away from consumerism to um, this beingness and all in you know, all encompassing beingness where it's less about the putting the waste over there because somebody else is going to look after it to kind of like integrating all of the aspects of ourselves just as much as we are the food that we eat. Yeah. I, I just, uh, something that came to me at a quick close is uh, Loka Samasta Suki no Bhavantu. May we all put forth that intention and effort to serve God in all ways, to see God in all beings, and whatever that word is for you, maybe it's the self, maybe it's the one, maybe it's the all, but the intention is the seed that is going to bear fruit of the new world that we will live in through these conversations and through all of us together collectively putting our intentions and our attention on that which we desire. Can't say anything more than that. Thank you, John. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, audience. Um, I, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm so grateful for the opportunity to, to be able to call attention to climate action. And, you know, please do follow us on Instagram and Facebook where we're sort of sharing these beautiful challenges, taking everybody through different themes every single day, putting so much effort into Rise to Replenish, uh, the People's Pledge. Today's theme is microgreens, growing your own food. Um, today, I pledge to nurture and grow more greens around me. Um, join me and many others who are also taking the pledge, um, not only for the goodies that you'll get, you know, there's one on one session coaching by me, um, there's workshops that we're hosting, an entire curriculum that we're launching, a VIP eco party, of course, you want to be there, um, featured on our social media and much, much more. Thank you all so much for joining us for this incredible talk. And I look forward to your comments and your suggestions on who we should have on the show, uh, what we should talk about, some of the questions that you really want to know answers to. Um, let us know and see you at the next talk.